Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for leading us to this point where you have challenged us that we should go and preach the gospel, spread the gospel, come under the authority and the lordship of Christ, and go to proclaim everywhere that Jesus is Lord. And Lord, we're telling you that by your grace and enablement, we will in Jesus' name. You helped the people that went before us. We know you can help us. What you need is just our yieldedness, our surrender, to do what you want us to do. And then you supply the grace, the power, the anointing that is necessary. And so, Lord, we bring ourselves before you. We're sorry, Lord, in the past, in any way that we have failed and disappointed you. Whatever the reason might have been. And we know that we are a forgiving God. We rejoice in your forgiveness of all that is past. Now we come to you anew afresh that we will go now and start as if we never did anything before. The rest of our lives, Lord, will be spent in spreading the gospel so that your heart for the great commission will be gladdened that you have an army of people who take what is closest to your heart very serious. Help us, Lord. And we pray as we do it faithfully unto you. Many souls will be saved and we ourselves will remain in the kingdom of God. And we pray that at last will be with you in glory and none of us will lose our reward in jesus name we pray in proverbs chapter 24 verses 21 and 22 my son fear thou the lord and the king and meddle not with them that are given to change. For their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both. Here the word of God comes to us as a great challenge. It tells us our responsibility. One, God word. Two, man word. It says, fear the Lord, the Lord who has called us, who has saved us, and who has given us a chance to publish, proclaim his name. Fear thou the Lord. And then telling the children of Israel, who had their leader titled as king, he said, fear the king also, because that is the human visible representative of the Almighty. And then he told them, he said, as you fear the Lord and fear the King, meddle not with them that are given to change. He's telling us today that we need to fear the Lord and we need to fear the leadership in the church. And we should not meddle with the people that are given to change. Because those people that are given to change, in verse 22, their calamity shall rise suddenly. And who can tell? The gravity, the height, the scope, the extent 
of the ruin that will come upon the people that are given to change. We're talking on God's unchanging standard in a changing world. The world in which we live is changing fast. In fact, it would have changed beyond recognition by the time the Antichrist will take over to rule in Satan's power. Between the time of Moses and the time of Jesus Christ, a lot of change are taking place in the standards in the world, in the morals in the world, in the spirituality, in the worship, in marriage, in family relationship, among the people that were calling upon the Lord. And although such great mighty change had come, terrible change, terrifying change, because it was change in the negative, yet Christ's main concern when he was here on earth was to confront the changing world with God's unchanging standard. Changes in the world and changes in the church are not for the better. They lead men farther and farther away from God's perfect standard. And the changes being advocated today by religious people are engineered by Satan to draw men away from God and to bring men closer to himself, that is, closer to the devil. Changes that are contrary to Scripture cannot be from the Holy Spirit, but from demons who cleverly work on the minds of men. And those men do not even notice and many times, changes can be slow and subtle until they reach a dangerously destructive and damning level that the unsuspecting members of the church will not know until they are forever lost, forever doomed, forever consigned to a burning hell from which they cannot escape. The church world is drowning in a sea of compromise and change. The pressure on the few remaining churches to change and conform to the world is enormous. The world church, the church in the world, the church that has compromised already, the church that is no more based on scripture uses psychology and pressure on the other churches that are still trying to stand to pull them down to their level of compromise. You might have heard from me before of the experiment of placing a frog in a pan of cool water on a stove and slowly increasing the heat until it gets to boiling point because the rise in temperature was so gradual it was imperceptible to the frog and that frog remained in the pan until the water began to boil, to boil. The frog simply adjusted to the heat as the heat was rising. And eventually, that frog boiled to death. And the experiment has been repeated by other people. And it's always the same result. That you put that frog in a pan, in a bowl of cool water. And you bring it, you bring the bowl of cool water on a burner. And there is a way you can slowly increase the heat of that burner. And the, and the water just increases, the temperature increases very slowly, very gradually. And the frog will not know. Because the skin has a way of adjusting itself to the rising temperature. Eventually, death is the result. Changes in the church changes in denominations 
occur like that so gradually that most members in the church hardly notice that any change is going on. Each small change in standard and in doctrine seems so insignificant in itself. Moral and spiritual standards have gradually eroded until Bible standards are forgotten, Christian lives are unscriptural, and error and falsehood are defended as acceptable, not only acceptable, beneficial. Many believers and churches should have jumped out of that pan of compromise long ago. And it is our responsibility, it is our duty to cry out against subtle changes in doctrine, subtle changes in lifestyle, subtle changes in worship, and subtle changes in practice. And those changes will be given attractive labels, will be given modern titles, and a lot of excuses and arguments will be brought to support and to defend those changes in doctrine and lifestyle, in worship and practice, that the average church member, the average worker, even the average pastor that doesn't know more than the surface of the Bible will not know that any change is even going on. And you know, it is possible if Jesus tarries. It is possible if it takes a very long time for the Lord to come. And I leave to go to the Lord before he returns. And of course, if I leave, somebody has to take over. If it so happens, the message is being recorded, the cassette will still be there. If it so happens, you remember that I said so? If it so happens, you might discover, to start with, that the week, the month, the year, it happens that I leave, there might come power struggle. Who takes over? Who becomes generous superintendent? If I knew before leaving that I was leaving, I might know, I might not know. Who knows? If I know, it may be that I might say that this is the next person to be the general superintendent. And God works in a way we cannot understand. It might be that a Joshua will be chosen and Caleb will wonder, why not me? It may be a young David, very young, will be chosen. And Eliab, older, more experienced, trained in the use of adult weapon, not catapult, not youth, teenage weapon. Trained in the use of adult weapon, will be wondering, why not me? And then, while the ordinary members are still wondering how they are going to do this or that, the burial, there is an undercurrent of, well, he is gone. Maybe when he put that David there, that David should take over, maybe he didn't really, you know, sometimes maybe he wasn't really understanding. This is a young fellow. And then the Eliabs might then begin to campaign. And you might be surprised. There might be a religious coup. That that little David that I might put there if I knew I was going might eventually be sidetracked, covered up, thrown away, even sent away from the church. 
one way or the other so that he will not even be ordinary worker not to talk of being Jesus. and the person who can talk the person who can say I am the one to do it he might eventually be able to talk himself into it and talk everybody into it and then eventually you have somebody there but not somebody appointed from above and then changes will begin and those changes might be so subtle those changes might be so small 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 that the people will just be rejoicing saying we thank god see things are becoming better the government is giving us more recognition we are becoming so accepted to the whole of the christian body in the nation thank god before you know that the water is boiling the church has died and that's why while i am still in the body of the flesh while i'm still in the clay i know sometimes the things i say no other person will say it and because no other person will say those things i have to make up my mind and say them because time is going the night is past spent and who knows what's going to happen tomorrow and if there is any concern in my heart and if there is any concern that ought to be in your heart it is that their standards their standards will never be changed because we're in a changing world churches have changed beyond recognition and pastors have changed beyond recognition and many people have changed beyond recognition men and women have changed but the word of God remains the same. And we must keep the high standard of the word of God. And by the grace of God, if we keep the standard, the standard will keep us. Let's think about three points. Number one, the changing, compromising church in the world. The changing, compromising church in the world number two the unchanging god and his permanent standard the unchanging god and his permanent standard number three uncompromising stand with God's unchanging standard number one the, un the changing compromising church in the world in first Timothy chapter 4 first Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, without a sensitive scripture based and scripture controlled conscience compromise is very easy influenced by seducing spirits church leaders depart from the faith and they lead churches to depart from the faith doctrines would still be taught but they will be doctrines of devils lies and hypocrisy always go side by side with compromise that's why it says in verse 2 speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron the spirit of the antichrist 
is the power behind many of the changes and the compromises in the church world today. Multitudes are taken captive, unawares, by the spirit of compromise. Galatians chapter 1, from verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there will be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. It happened in the early church. The Galatians had been brought to know the Lord. And God had used Paul the apostle to lay line upon line, precept upon precept for them. And then for some time, the Galatian church and Paul who helped in bringing that church to the level it had, the art of physical separation. And then some other people started influencing them. And do you know that these Galatians were already getting involved with another gospel, a gospel of a different kind? And Paul the Apostle said, I marvel, I'm surprised, I am shocked, I'm almost shocked out of my senses. I couldn't believe this, that ye are so soon. When did I leave you? Wasn't I there some time ago? Were you not the people that loved me so much because I shared the gospel with you? I trust when I share the gospel with you, the way you embraced the gospel, the way you loved the gospel, the way you gave yourself to the gospel, you could have plucked out your eyes and given to me Look at chapter 4 of Galatians. Chapter 4 of Galatians, verse 15. Where is then the blessedness ye spoke of? Were you not the people rejoicing, saying, Thank God for this gospel? Thank God for this standard? Thank God for this preacher? Thank God what a mighty blessing we have as this preacher has come to bring the light of the gospel to us. And Paul the Apostle said, So soon, so soon, you have been removed unto another gospel. Where is the blessedness you speak of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. But do you know, that the people that went to brainwash the Galatians, they did it so cleverly that the people started regretting that they listened to Paul. In fact, these people now were almost making Paul an enemy of the Galatians. Paul who had told them the gospel, the people that came to brainwash them, they were already telling them that, well, you know that, uh, Paul, and they began to find out something is finding fault. And then he said, verse 16, Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth, the people that came to influence them did it so zealously. Look at verse 17. They zealously affect you, but not well. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they will exclude you that ye might affect them. And so Paul the Apostle was surprised that these Galatian believers who had received the gospel from him and who had embraced, appreciated, and loved, and talked much about that gospel, they had already gone aside. In chapter 1 verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, which is not another, which is not another. There is no substitute. There is no replacement for sound doctrine, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you. They will come in the day. They will come in the night. They will write letters to you. They will send cases to you. 
They will try to tell you that, you see, if you just listen to uh, that man, he will sound convincing. But you don't know the other side of uh, the presentation of the gospel. And they will trouble you and trouble you. And would, they will pervert the gospel of Christ. Then look at verse 8. He said, Galatians, you have listened to quite a lot of us. You listen to Paul. You listen to others. Now he says, Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which, he have, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's strong language. Strong language. Here Paul, number one, he put himself under a curse. He said, though we, I being number one of the we. Because here was Paul, he had preached the gospel to them. He said, I don't believe this will happen, but should in case it happens. That I, Paul, turn around and I come to you Galatians. And I begin to tell you that... The things we preached before, salvation in Christ, sanctification and holiness, baptism in the Holy Ghost, and the necessity of evangelism as a believer's ministry, and the one man, one wife, and the imminent coming of the Lord, and all the necessity, the necessary preparation we need to make so that we can see the Lord when he appears. If I, Paul, if I turn around, I, Paul, who had been to the third heavens. I, Paul, who had been stoned, left dead, and I got up again. I, Paul, who had taken all those lashes and suffered so much for the gospel. I, Paul, who by the grace of God have ministered and have, uh, have demonstrated the signs of an apostle. If I, Paul, will come to you Galatians and I preach another gospel, a different doctrine, unto you you will know that i myself i come under a curse then he said not just me the we we that means all of us who are preached unto you and if we take the scripture the way we should take it it will mean though we who stood on this pulpit during this congress though we who gave you all those seminars during this congress? Don't we who have ministered to you in the various retreats and in congresses and conferences that we have held and we have blessed you in your state, in your region, in your nation? Don't we who have led you into the salvation message, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism? Though we who told you before, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all the things that are in the world, the pride of life, the loss of the flesh. It says all these things are not of the Father. The world passeth away and the things therein. And only he that doeth the will of God will abide forever. Though we who have told you that before, if we turn around and we say, well, we have now got new light new revelation new understanding new interpretation if we do that and we bring another gospel unto you we ourselves will be cursed and you're sitting down you're preached in your churches you are preached in the retreats although maybe you didn't preach here but you are one of us we're preachers what i preach you have preached what you preach you have preached and we have used these same outlines together. We have used the same Monday Bible study that we used at the headquarters. You have used them also in your location. You have listened to the cases that we send out from here. And you have taken some notes. And you have given that exactly to your congregation. Sometimes some of you have even taken the cassette literally. And you have called your congregation together. And they have listened. Uh, we have preached the same thing. We have said the same thing. The way we, su we suffered persecution in Nigeria is the way you have suffered persecution in your country for preaching the same thing now. Though we are an angel from heaven. It's possible somebody will tell us an angel appeared to me when I was waiting upon the Lord 
when I was fasting and he told me that uh, that angel, in fact, if I describe the angel to you, I don't need the description. That angel told me to change the word that says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That angel is cursed. That dream is cursed. That revelation is cursed. And the man and the woman that accepts that angel, that accepts that different revelation, that man or woman is also cursed. We are to stand upon the word of God because though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He says it again in verse 9. As we said before, which means when Paul was with them, he had given them the warning before. He had told them before. And now he says, as we said before, so say I now again. If any man, if any man, whoever, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And so you will see how serious it is that the world in which we live has gone away from the Lord in the very terrible spirit of compromise. In Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 2 from verse 11, as a nation changed their gods, which yet are no gods, but my people, the children of Israel, have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have healed them out cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water. The substitute gospel will be powerless. The substitute gospel will not have what it takes for us to be able to live a pure life, a holy life, an acceptable life in the sight of the Lord. It will be broken cistern that cannot hold any water. It might appear attractive, it might appear like it's going to make life easy for us. It might appear that more people are going to come into the congregation if we lower the standard. But that broken system will not be able to hold any water. Do you know the spirit behind those changes? Those compromises? In Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. This is talking about the Antichrist. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And seem to change times and laws. And it shall be given unto his son until a time and times and a dividing of time. That's talking about the Antichrist. Who will come for a time? That's one times, two times there, making three, and a dividing of time, three and a half. And so you find that it is the spirit of the Antichrist that is bringing all the changes. And the people of God, supposedly following the Lord, but who don't pray much, who don't read the word of God much, who are following after the civilization, modern, modernization of the world, and are feeling that we cannot remain just on the Bible. We have to bring in this and bring in this and bring in that. You see, all those people, they'll be influenced by the spirit of the Antichrist. And the changes will come in Ezekiel chapter 5. Ezekiel chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And she has changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations. 
and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. For they have refused my judgments and my statutes. They have not walked in them. Look at Jerusalem. That God himself established. He said, I have set that Jerusalem in the midst of the nations and the countries that are round about her. And yet, this is the controversy of Almighty God against his people. And it is the same thing with the church today. I mean, the church world. That the church that ought to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the representative of God, a royal nation, a kingdom of priests, that church is changing. And some of the churches have changed beyond recognition. Many times we have spoken about the Methodist Church. That church has changed from the time of John Wesley beyond recognition. But maybe the way we speak about others in a few years, others may be speaking about us too. Some time ago, a sister, not in deeper life, she belongs to another church, Gospel Church, here in Nigeria. And she saw the deeper life in her community was changing a little, changing a little. And she wrote to me. And then I think she spoke to one of us and said, please, please, I am not in deeper life, but our church uses the cassettes, the literature, and everything. The only thing that you feel that we're not deep alive is the difference in name. But the deeper life among us are changing. That is the deeper life in our community. And then that person was pleading, saying, please, for the sake of us who are outside, who know that our pastors don't know enough, and it is the case set of deeper life and the literature of deeper life that is sustaining us. And we are only remaining in those churches so that we can evangelize for the sake of those of us who are there, who are watching you. Please, for us, because of us, don't change. I got another note from another person. I think a sister again. And this sister said, in fact, the husband of that sister is a minister, the head of the ministry. And the husband of that sister, I think, traveled overseas and met some other Christians. He came back as the overseer of his church and he wanted to make some changes. The wife rose up and the wife said, you know, if you make that change, I don't care what you do, I'm not going to support you. And said, look at the case, the polite case. Look at the literature. This is the truth. If you go to America, go anywhere, you see another thing, you bring it into this church. When the church sees that I am against you, this church will scatter on your head because although I am not attending deeper life inside me, inside my bone and blood, there's deeper life planted there that this family cannot take away. Do you know that that man, overseer of his church, because the wife said, if you change openly, I'm going to tell the church that I'm not with you. That man was forced to come back to the Bible and re-examine the Bible again and say, now I see. And they prayed in that family and washed off all the influence of America. And that church is still there. It's not deeper life. It's not deeper life. That sister wrote to me and he said, please, please, don't change. If you change, if you are changed, I would not have been able to influence my husband like that. You know, in Nigeria here, there's another church. That church, that was the time, they came together like this on Sunday. And instead of the pastor, I mean big pastor, wonderful pastor, not deep alive, Instead of the pastor rising up to preach, he said today, you are going to listen to a message. 
Because if I told you myself, maybe you will argue. He said, everybody sit down, and I will sit down. And he brought a tape recorder, and he put Deeper Life cassette. And that cassette was a tough message. Everybody listened. At the end of the message, he rose up and said, that is it. That's the standard. That's what we are going to follow. Rise up. They rose, they rose up and they began to pray. Not deeper life, but all those churches are watching us. If you change, the blood of all those people will be upon us. That's why I know the people inside. I know the people outside. I was sharing with one of our missionaries yesterday that herald of his coming that is published overseas wrote in their magazine it was one of a region overseas in Nigeria here that sent the magazine to me they reproduced others may I cannot very tough track that we wrote and those people overseas they said if you are going to hear standard if you want to know what is the real thing that all this one that we are doing, then they said, this is a track written by an African and they reproduced it there. Others may and I, I cannot. And I didn't have a copy of the track myself. I asked at home and they were able to give me a copy. And I read through and I saw the other one that they reproduced. I said, ah, ah. so people outside deeper life, so I thought it just these people in Nigeria that will play the cassette of deeper life, this overseas, that they even put that one there. How then can we change now? If we change, angels will condemn us. Other churches will condemn us. Evil sinners will condemn us. In Lagos here, there is a man, an unbeliever, is not born again. It's not coming to deeper life, but he will bring his wife to church on Sunday and drop the wife in church and then go to wherever he wants to go. If when they were discussing a particular place and the wife of another person, the man was complaining that my wife, uh, I don't know how to, ah, he said, you don't know what to do. Take your wife to deeper life. That since my wife went to deeper life, her life, everything at home, everything changed. He said, although I myself, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm not joining them yet, but in the morning, if the woman is getting late, he will say, church, is it not uh, 8 o'clock you start your service? You'll be late, you'll be late. Unbeliever, telling the wife, saying, you will be late for church, and will carry her and take her to deeper life church. If we have a retreat, he will encourage her to go and stay at the retreat and hear the word of God. If we change, sinners will condemn us. They were talking in a particular place. And these were big, big men. And these big men were talking. And uh, they were talking negative things about the leader of deeper life. And one of them there not a born-again Christian. I know him, and I know the church he affiliates with. And he himself doesn't profess to be born again, but the wife is born again and a member of Deeper Life. The man rose up. He said, you people, keep quiet. That person you are talking about, I know him. I know the effect of that church in my family, in my wife. You people, keep quiet. If all the churches... I like that church and all the preachers are like that preacher this country will change in a short space of time that's a sinner they know what we stand for although they are not able to do it themselves but they are glorifying God that here we are that by, great, by the grace of God we're able to establish the standard and to maintain the standard the world is influencing a lot of churches. But I've also got um, some letters to encourage me. I mean from outside deeper life. Even some people that I would think 
that these people will be so much against us that they want everything to crumble. But they will write and they will say, you can count on us that although we are not in deeper life, and although we are not able to do it the way you are doing it, but we know this is the truth. And we hear that some things are happening that may make you change because other churches have changed. Then they tell me, they even counsel me in their writing. They say, whatever some of those people do, don't change, remain the way you are. We are praying for you. We are not part of deeper life, but we know that God set up deeper life to show the light to the whole nation. If people outside are saying so, why those of us who are inside, don't you know what you have? Do you need an outsider to tell you the great heritage that God has given to us in this church? Our God loves us. And we should respond to God in love that because of what he has given us, and because of the value, by the grace of God, we will not compromise in Jesus' name. See, in the days in which we live, it's an era of compromise. And churches hardly have any conviction anymore. The majority of people hold some conviction, listen, only until it conflicts with their comfort. And if they hold a particular conviction, if it conflicts with their comfort, then they keep the comfort and they do away with their conviction. Or if it conflicts with their desires, with their ambition, with their self-centered goals, they want those self-centered goals so much that they will drop the conviction that they have. Even in our midst, some so-called leaders are forsaking the high standard of God's word. And they are following after the rule of expediency or maybe a big word to you pragmatism what it means is the way they reason if it works if it accomplishes their private goals if it increases the physical visible size of the church they feel it must be right and acceptable many are no longer concerned for a biblical standard Whatever accomplishes their personal private goals will have to replace God's high standard. The church that is afraid to speak the whole truth in a confrontive situation is a compromising church. If the distinctive doctrines of the Bible are shoved under or into background because we do not want to offend somebody or because we are afraid of the consequences, then we have been influenced by the spirit of compromise. This, the philosophy and the practice of compromise has found its way into the church through leading men and women. Many have compromised so repeatedly that they don't even understand anymore what compromises are. Compromise is the inability to deal with biblical data as God intends because we are overwhelmed with our own personal desires. So we substitute ourselves as the ones to be pleased in the place of God. Do you know that compromise has devastating effects? What are the effects that compromise has? Number one, compromise destroys our fellowship with God. Compromise destroys our fellowship with God. God cannot maintain relationship, cannot maintain fellowship with anyone that compromises his word. Number two, compromise removes true anointing from our lives. We may still be able to quote scriptures and preach fine and use grammar, but really, if you are compromising, that compromise removes true anointing from your life. Number three, compromise exposes us to shame, ridicule, and oppression of Satan. If you compromise, Satan knows, and he knows the influence he wields on you, and it will expose you to shame and ridicule and oppression. Number four, compromise brings defeat and suffering. Compromise brings defeat and suffering. 
Number five, compromise turns us into God's enemies. Compromise turns us into God's enemies. Number six, compromise changes the course of history for us, for our families, and for many others. Number seven, compromise takes heaven and eternal reward away from us. Let me remind you of some history. Adam compromised, followed his wife's sin, and lost paradise. Abraham compromised, took to his wife's advice. He bought Ishmael, and we have lost paradise. Peace in the Middle East. Esau compromised for a meal with Jacob and he lost his birthright. Saul compromised the divine word and he lost divine favor and lost the royal line. Eli compromised and he lost divine presence symbolized of the, uh, by the ark lost his two sons in one day and he lost the priesthood Samson compromised his righteous devotion as a Nazarite and his divine power, light and sight and his life were all lost Solomon compromised he lost the United Kingdom of Israel. Judas, Demas, and many others compromised, and they lost their eternal souls. Compromise is a sad word. Yet, we must realize that though whole denominations may change their messages and convictions, God remains unchanged. He'll be forever the same. That leads us to point number two. The unchanging God and his permanent standard. The unchanging God and his permanent standard. Let's see that God is unchanging and his standard is unchanging. In Malachi chapter 3, the first part of verse 6. Malachi chapter 3, the first part of verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. God does not change. And the standard of his word does not change. In Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Before you are born, before you are born again, before you are called into the ministry of preaching, the word of the Lord had been settled forever in heaven. And even after you have left, if you leave, the word of God will still be forever settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The word of our God shall stand forever. And this is the word that is preached unto you in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 24 and 25. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word. Praise the Lord. The word we're talking about that will never pass away, 
that will still go on and keep fresh even after all the glories of men have passed away. It says, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The same word that has power to change lives. This is the word which is preached unto you. In Hebrews 13 verse 8. Hebrews 13 verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. If Jesus were here today, he'll preach exactly the same thing he preached when he was here in his earthly ministry. In fact, what did he tell the church? Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 from verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And there is what to teach. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, if you are doing that, if you are keeping to the word he has commanded, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. From these references we have read together, you will understand that God and his standard cannot change. Though only eight souls were found worthy to escape the flood, God didn't change his standard to accommodate more people. Only eight out of the whole world. He didn't have to change his standard. Though Moses the great, seemingly indispensable leader of Israel, had to be prevented from entering the promised land. God did not change his standard. Even when it affected Moses so much, and he prayed and prayed about it, God didn't have to change his standard. You remember David, the man after God's heart. He sinned, and he had to be chastised severely. You know why? Because God would not change his standard. And though few, only few, would be saved of the teeny multitudes in these last days. God will not because say, we will not say because we are few. He will not say because of that, he will change his standard so as to accommodate more in his kingdom. God's standard is high, permanently high. Jesus is as unchanging as the Father. He said, I and my Father are one. John 10, 30. If Christ were here, as I told you before, in this world today, he would preach exactly what he preached in his earthly ministry. Till the end of the world, he wants us to teach and practice and maintain all things whatsoever he has commanded. Can you think of the things that Jesus preached? Let me run through them quickly. When Jesus was here on earth, I will not have the time because my time is slipping away from me. I will not have the time to quote the references to you. But just listen. And since you are Bible preachers yourself, you remember where Jesus said these things. Where Jesus emphasized these doctrines I'm going to uh, give you. And when you get back home, get the cassette. And listen and play it slowly. And maybe form your notes. Because you will not be able to write a full note now. And as you form your note, search your Bible in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, if, and the first chapter of Acts. And you will see the very things that Jesus said. You may also have to go to the Revelation because he said some things directly there. And you will see that these were the very doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ as taught, as expressed by himself. Let's go on. Jesus preached the inspiration, the infallibility, and the completeness of Scripture. Two, he also preached divine perfection, the eternity, the immutability, the triunity of the Godhead. Three, he preached the eternal pre existence of himself, of Christ, his incarnation, his sinless life. His atoning death and his glorious resurrection. Jesus also preached the depravity and lostness of man, the insufficiency of man's righteousness for salvation, 
and the free will of man to choose life or death. He said, I would have gathered you under my wings, but ye would not. That's the free will of man to choose either salvation or damnation. Jesus preached the repentance as a necessary prerequisite for salvation. I'm sure you know. He preached the necessity of transformation through the new birth. He said, ye must be born again. And then he said, except your righteousness will exceed the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom. He preached water baptism for genuine converts. He preached discipleship, self-denial, bearing the cross, enduring persecution, overcoming temptation. Jesus preached his lordship over the Christian and his headship over the church. He preached holiness, heart purity, sanctification. He preached the Lord's Supper and committed it into the hands of the disciples to carry it on. He preached the deity, the distinct personality of the Holy Spirit with his divine attributes and works. He also preached baptism in the Holy Spirit for sanctified believers. He preached and encouraged the oppression of the gifts of the Spirit for the edification of the body of Christ, not for the exaltation of self. Design shall follow them that believe. You know the rest. He preached obedient, obedience to God and love for God. To love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He preached marriage of one man to only one woman for life until death separates them. He preached fasting. He preached unwavering faith. He preached prevailing prayer. He preached evangelism and missions, telling us that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. He wants us to take the gospel to every creature in all nations of the world. He preached divine healing and deliverance as the children's bread. He preached the resurrection of the dead. He preached the rapture of the saints in my father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there ye may be also. He preached the great tribulation. He preached the second coming, when the Son of Man shall appear and shall come in the glory with the clouds. He preached his reign on earth in power and great glory. He preached the judgment of all men and women that ever lived by Christ, by himself, at the end of the age. He preached rewards in heaven for righteous Christians. And he preached eternal punishment in hell for sinners. Jesus spoke about hell more than he spoke about water baptism. He spoke about hell more than he spoke about marriage. He spoke about hell more than he spoke about love. He spoke about hell more than he spoke about many, many things. He emphasized that the people that do not repent and they die a Christless life will go to a Christless grave and they will spend eternity in a burning lake of fire. All these things Jesus preached. And then Jesus tells us that his standard is unchanging. Go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. If you do that, if you do that, it is on that basis I will have fellowship with you. And lo, I am with you till the end of the world. True Christians will keep to Christ's standard. 
ministers who keep a spiritual link with the master with, will hold the same standard he held. God is wiser than all men. And he will not change his standard because of anyone. God is high and holy, so is his standard. God is unchangeable, so is his standard. God is eternal, so is his truth. God is, God's standard will remain eternally exalted above redeemed men, among redeemed men and angels when all the preachers have been melted, that is all the compromising preachers have been melted away with fervent heat and they have passed away into a damned eternity. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, but God's word shall never pass away. Amen. Amen. Let me conclude with point number three. Uncompromising stand with God's unchanging standard. The Lord has been revealing his might unto us these days that we have been together. And the Lord is now challenging us to go back home, go back to our local churches, go back to our regions and states and nations, and go to preach the word the way you have heard it on this pulpit by the preachers that the Lord has given us that have faithfully declared the word of truth. And now in Jude verse 3, Jude verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Do it. That's the responsibility I've given you. Earnestly contend. Earnestly contend. Some people don't like contending. They are so loving. They are so appreciative for people. And they want everybody to love them and accept them. They want people after their message to be able to say, that was comforting. That was loving. That was nice. And for another person to reply, you know, it's always like that. She never hurts anybody. It's just a good preacher that we love very much. Then you cannot contend. Because there will be people who want to go their way. There will be people who want to bring in worldliness. There will be people who want to compromise. There will be people who want to lower the standard. And if you are not going to have that contending spirit, fighting the good fight of faith, how are you going to bring those people back into the standard of the word of God? Earnestly contend for the faith, which was once and for all given unto the saints. In 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. These things command and teach. A preacher has to have some kind of authority. The posture, the language, the disposition on the pulpit has to command some respect and authority. And you have to present the word not in a compromising tone, not in a tone as if you are looking for the people to love you and appreciate you. When you go back to your local church, when you come to the pulpit like this, you realize you are the representative of God Almighty. And it doesn't matter the attitude of the people to you. Stand there and these things command and teach. In verse 15, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Give thyself completely unto these things, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take each unto thyself, and unto the doctrine. Continue in there. For in doing this, only in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself. Preacher, you are not completely saved yet, until you keep the totality of the word of God. Until you meditate upon these things. Until you pass everything across to the people who are listening to you. Until you take heed to yourself. And unto the doctrine. To continue in them. It is when you do that, you will both save yourself and save the people that hear you. If you are not preaching doctrine, the people that are hearing you will not be saved. It will mean that you are wasting your time. In fact, it's worse than wasting your time because the judgment of God will come. 
Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 23 to verse 24. And ye shall not walk in the manner of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, therefore I abhorred them. 24. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land. I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. God told the children of Israel, I separated you from other people. Some pastors, because they want to be accepted by all the other people. They want to be accepted by the Christian association of their nation. They want to be accepted by the evangelical fellowship of their nation. They want to be accepted by the religious society of their nation. They do not understand anymore the distinct, separate entity that the true church is. The true church is like a small circle in a big circle. It's like a group of people so different among many, many people. And if you mix up so much, you mix up so much with all the other people, you will lose the standard. Somebody came to me and said in Nigeria here that the other churches they wanted to have a particular program and then asked me whether he should go take our members there take a choir there take our people there get involved in that program I said no don't go then he told me that what the people are saying is a deeper life invites us I said yes but that when they invite us, we don't come. I said yes. So there's nothing wrong in that. I will invite Muslims to come because I know I have the word of salvation. If the Muslim invites me, I won't go. I won't go to the mosque. But I will invite him to come to a program we will hear about the Lord. I know the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I will invite Jehovah's Witnesses. I'll tell them, come. Something good is going on. Come. I will try to plead with them and influence them. I'll give them the tracks. I'll give them the handbill. I'll say, you must come. You ask me. Suppose he comes and he hears what we preach. He honors our invitation. And then he turns around and invites me to come to the kingdom hall. Will I go? No. I have what he doesn't have. That's why I invited him. He doesn't have what I'm looking for. That's why I don't honor his invitation. If the mormons are in your country, you have to invite them. You will bring them. You talk to their leaders. You say, we're having a particular program. This will benefit you. They will come. Suppose the Mormons are then going to have their own program and they invite you. Are you supposed to go and take all our members to the Mormons? No. You can't say because uh, you want to reach out to the celestial in Nigeria here in West Africa. You want to reach out to the Cherum and Seraphim, the white garment churches in Nigeria and West Africa here. And the Zionists in southern uh, part of Africa. You can't say because you want to reach out to them. You want them to come to a deeper life retreat. You say, I must be wise. Now that wisdom will take you to hell. Be careful. I must be wise. If they invite me, shouldn't I go? You shouldn't go. You shouldn't go because the Lord has called you to be separated from the religious confusion of the nations. In verse 26, and ye shall be holy unto me, 
For I am the Lord am holy. And I have severed you. I have separated you from other people that ye should be mine. Don't mix up the doctrine of the Bible or the celestial notion with the cherub and seraphim notion and with the Mormon notion and with the Jehovah's Witnesses notions and the Catholics dogma. Be very careful. The Lord has called us and he has set us apart and he has said that we should publish preach proclaim the gospel until the end of the world so uncommon is the standard of the lord so high and so great so holy is the standard of the word of the lord we need unashamed boldness in standing firm for the truth to stand uncompromisingly for the truth we need some things number one the fear of God in our hearts, which will totally erase the fear of men that brings a snare. Before you can stand uncompromisingly for the truth of the word of God, you'll have to have the fear of God, fear of God in your heart, which will totally erase the fear of man that brings a snare. Number two, there must be a willingness to lose friends. A willingness to lose friends. And then to be thought mad and beside yourself. So, Paul, thou art mad. Much learning, much religion. You are beside yourself. Much religion has made you mad. Oh, he said, no. I speak words of soberness. But people will think you are mad. The way you talk, the way you live, the way you preach, the way you organize, the way you lead the church, they will think that you're off your senses. Don't mind. Be ready. Be willing to lose friends. Number three, we need boldness to declare the whole counsel of God before friends and before strangers. Before friends and before strangers, caring for nothing except the glory of God. Caring for nothing except the glory of God. Number four, we need firmness to say no. Firmness to say no. You know, I've been so strong at this retreat on the family. And I've been strong on that because I realize that many of the times we have preached on the family, including myself, because we are trying to correct the problems in the families, we try to tell the, the husbands, love your wives. And that's true. But there's a limit to that law. There's a limit to that law. If your wife requires you to take a step which will amount to compromising the word of God. You have to say no to that one. For some people today, it's difficult. But in the early years of deeper life, it wasn't difficult. We loved God and loved the word of God above above wife or above husband i just told you of a sister in another church whose husband wanted to change because he saw some eternal security uh, things in the in the states and he came over he came home and also on marriage he wanted to change that if a man had already divorced he can get another woman now the woman said no that if you do it and you tell the church he had already called the elders of that church the woman said i will oppose you i told you already and it was that woman that said no to the husband that preserved that church in deeper life you wives you'll have to get to the position where you know that this is the word of god and you will not compromise that you have to say no to your husband you say 
Suppose I say no and, sh and he beats me. Praise the Lord. You know? If you don't say no and you try to preserve yourself, he will not beat you, but he will not realize he has backslidden. When he brings a false doctrine, he will still think he's a child of God. When you say no, the spirit that is contrary to the Bible is going to engineer him and is going to slap you. The moment he slaps you, he himself will now know that, aha, uh -huh. now that you have reached this stage, you know now you are backsliding. He won't know that before. That slapping, that beating will be an evidence that will send him back to his knees and will make him to know, I have gone. Let him beat you. Let him beat you. Oh, you say, he might even pack all my loads and send all my loads up. Praise the Lord. Then, when the members of the church know that the preacher has had a disagreement at home and he has driven his wife out, praise the Lord, he will not be able to deceive the church anymore because then the church will know that the man is gone. Let him do it. Let him do it. Let him do it. That will help you. It will help us. It will help the church. Because then you will not be able to deceive anybody. But while you are saying, I don't want trouble. I don't want trouble. <laughs> Why don't you want trouble? Jesus had trouble with Pharisees. Why don't you want trouble? Jesus had trouble with Sadducees. Why don't you want trouble? He had trouble with Herod. He had trouble with Pilate. Why don't you have tr want trouble? He had trouble with Judas Iscariot. Oh Lord, I want trouble. <laughs> Who doesn't want trouble here? Because it says it is in persecution that we are going to inherit the kingdom of God. If anyone will live a godly life in this world, he will suffer persecution. If anybody is here and you don't have any persecution, you don't have any trouble, it's one of the prayer I'm going to pray for you that, oh Lord, send persecution. And the church will say, Amen. It's the persecution that makes us to know that we are not a friend of the devil. It's the persecution that will make us to know that we are not of the world. It is the persecution that will make us to know that we are the people of God. Why shouldn't you have trouble? I have trouble. Why should you be different? I have persecution of what family are you? Are you, are you not of this same family? If I, your father in the Lord, if I have each, if you don't have come at the end of the service, I'll share some and give them as a gift to you. Therefore, don't worry that your husband will do this or do that. And your husband, be able to say no. If your wife is saying, I want to bring attachment to my ear, you say, not in this house. I want to go and do permit, you say, not in this house. Eh, all this, uh, uh, this one and this carefulness, I am going to start using little jewelry. If you do, if you do, in the church, as I discipline choir members, as I discipline ushers, as I discipline children workers, I'm going to discipline you publicly. If you do, you are going to lose your ministry. And in this house, I will not beat you. I will not fight. I will give you food. I'll give you water. But it means you have gone and I will take the vow and the consecration of a eunuch. We can't have relationship. Heaven is dear. Heaven is dear. You want to destroy what I give my whole life for? What I left the world behind for? You can't say, even if you have not been convinced mentally, you cannot say, because this is the ministry of my husband. I won't touch that jewelry, even if I'm not convinced yet. But this is a ministry of my husband. Me jewelry for the sake of my husband. For the sake of his ministry. Even if the devil puts it in my ear. The jewelry and the ear. I yank everything out immediately. It is. This is what we call Christianity. Thank God Christianity is coming back. And the Lord is calling every one of you saying that you'll be able to say no to your wife. And I believe not the wives that are here, the wives that are here, you know, from Monday night and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, the Lord has cleansed them. And the Lord has purified them. And the Lord has transformed them. Not the women here, the women here are transformed already. But if that woman is at home, didn't hear all that I'm saying, you know what to do for that wife? Take this cassette and let the wife play the cassette and sit down together and then when i say something hard say praise the lord 
and your wife will look at you and say, this man has changed. And then when I say, the wife will not support you and put jewelry in the ears, yank out that thing, say, Amen, praise the Lord. Congress will come to your family. Revival will come to your church. If you will make up your mind that no, here I am standing by the grace of God and my family is standing on that same word of God, you can stand as well. Your family can stand as well. Why don't you stand up and tell the Lord, I will stand. I will stand. I will stand. I will not allow anything, anyone to destroy the word that God has given unto me. We need to take all these cases to all our other leaders, zonal leaders, all the women representatives, all our workers, all our members of the choir, everyone back at home in our churches, go and play this, all the cases to them. All the cases to them. All the cases to them. Have a Congress retreat. Have a Congress retreat. Let your family be there. Let your workers be there. Let all your people be there. And get all those cases on doctrine. All those cases on church planting. All those cases on dominion. All those cases on death through anxiety and life through faith. All the cases on fasting and prayer and spiritual warfare. The cases on singleness, one Lord, one goal, one life. All the cases that we have listened to. And a series on prayer and everything the Lord has exposed to us get all the workers together get all the people together let them have a retreat let them have a retreat and let the fire of God come back again to the church let the truth of God come back again to the church let the life of holiness come back again to the church let the life of firm uncompromising standard standing with the Word of God come back to the church again Stand for the truth and stand with the truth. Stand for the truth and stand with the truth. Earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Will you stand? Will you stand? Will you stand for the truth standing steadfastly for the doctrines of the apostles? Standing steadfastly for the unchanging truth, unchanging word of our holy God. Will you stand? Stand at home and stand in the office. Will you stand in your family and stand in the church? Standing for the truth. Standing for the truth. Standing for the truth. You stand for the truth, then the truth will stand by you. If you stand for the truth, then the truth will stand by you. Don't fear any man. Let the fear of God cancel the fear of man in your heart. Let the word of God crush anything that needs to be crushed out of your heart. That needs to be crushed out of your life. 
give yourself completely and entirely to the Lord. This is the old path. Walk ye therein.